Um, this thing we call the strengthening exercise, it's interesting what we're really doing. When you've had an experience, um, it gets labeled. And the reason it gets labeled is the amygdala tries to keep you safe. And it doesn't have time or the intelligence, because it's really small, to look at everything that's going on and analyze it. So what happens is when something happens and you intellectually analyze it, it gets labeled with what neuroscientists call a, a positive valence, a neutral valence, or a negative valence. And the amygdala itself has sensors to pick up positive and negative a valence. And it's interesting that if it goes to a negative valence, of course, it's going to release stress hormones. But even a neutral valence, it will release some stress hormones on the basis of better, safe, and sorry. It's only the positive valence um, labels that it gives a pass and even produces calming. So what happens is that we've all had experiences that have labeled traumatic experiences with not in control not able to escape. Even like when you were taken to a pediatrician at five years old, you got a shot. That was terrible for a five-year-old kid, right? Or whatever. And you weren't able to, to control the situation at all and you couldn't escape it. So that's just, an, that's just the beginning. There's going to be a number of situations that don't work out very well for us and we don't like being out of control and then unable to escape. So a situation like this, for example, gets labeled see that there's the airplane in the background it gets labeled oh no escape no control and as soon as the amygdala sees those labels it gives you stress hormones mm -hmm. and what we want to do is change the labels um i've been playing around with this story i kind of like it this um if you were going to have a party and it's going to be a little fancy you're going to have some crackers with caviar on a tray uh, about 15 minutes before you expect the guests to arrive, you get out the crackers, put them on the tray, and then you look for this can of caviar, and then you realize, uh-oh, I think I forgot to buy it. So you jump in the car, run down to the grocery store. You can't get real caviar at most grocery stores, but you can get something they call caviar for about 20 bucks. So you pick up one of those. Not the best you could do, maybe, but that's the best you can do at the moment. So you got one item, and to get back quick and set it up, the ideal place to go is self-checkout. Now, the, the scanner at the self-checkout is a lot like the amygdala. The scanner doesn't say, oh, open up the can and let me expect what's inside. It doesn't do that. It only says, I just want to see the barcode. You run the barcode by the scanner. It says caviar, 20 bucks. Great. You reach into your pocket for your credit card. You realize you rushed out and didn't bring your wallet. So now what are you going to do? Well, it's, you dig in your pockets. Maybe you got some cash. And sure enough, you've got a $5 bill. Now here's the problem. This is 20 bucks. You got five bucks. Now you wouldn't do this probably, but you could take your can of caviar over back into the store and find the pet food area and make sure no one is looking and pick up a can of cat food and carefully take the label off of it, lick the label, and put the label around your caviar and check out for 99 cents. <laughs> so what we want to do on the plane is check out not only for 99 cents, we'd like to get cash back. <laughs> so where do we get the cash back labels? Where do we get the really positive labels? It turns out that even at birth, a, a child is genetically programmed to respond positively to certainly three things mom's face soft loving eyes the sound of her voice and it seems to work a little better if she just brings her voice up just a little bit and then also touch so that's there at birth and it doesn't go away we still have that so when we are with a person who is genuinely safe to be with physically and emotionally their face sends us signals that it's okay to be around them. Their voice gives us signals which activate our calming system and their body language or touch is, is good. 
So let's imagine you're with her and she's giving you signals that it's comfortable to be with you and you're giving her signals that is vice versa, that she's comfortable, she's can be comfortable with you. That's nice. That's why you're together, probably. And then she just amazingly enough has this picture. I don't know how she got it, but she puts it by her face. And her face is more powerful than this picture. The signals coming from her face overwrite whatever is here. So this is the first of three steps to override and overwrite the code that's attached to this situation. Second step, you look at it together. You imagine she holds a corner, you hold a corner, you talk talk a little bit about it. So all we, it doesn't even matter what the words are or the phrases or the logic. What matters really is the same as with the baby. Baby doesn't understand words. What matters here is the quality of her voice. It's like the music matters, not the words. And then the third thing is as you're talking, you notice her arms around you and you're feeling an affectionate hug. Face, voice, and touch. That changes the labeling here. So the next time you run into this situation, once again, remember, the amygdala doesn't examine the situation, doesn't look for what's in the can. It says, I want to read the barcode. Oh, the code looks good. So I'm going to give that a pass. It's that simple. So what we want to do is to go through the things that are going to happen on the plane and change the code. You've seen the photographs in the video, but they're also on the website. Yes, because you can click through them at your own pace, or you can uh, print them out and run through this, imagining it's being held by her, or even if she wants to be part of it, you could run through it for real with her once or twice. There are three phases to the exercise. Let me just pop the uh, page up here so it's easy to... Um, to talk about it, fearflying.com slash photos. Okay, what we've got here is phase one, phase two, and phase three. Mm -hmm. And there are 24 pictures here as they are in the videos, I believe. Um, and so we've already talked about how to link these up. Now, phase two is a little different um, because you see, in this case, stuff is coming from outside into you and in order for what's outside to become inside where you're aware of it, there's a little bit of processing time. It's very quick, but it's during that processing time that the amygdala gets to decide what the whether it's going to release stress or most based on the code. But this stuff here, this is already inside. When you say, what if, what if, what if, what if there's turbulence? What if this doesn't work? What if I panic? We can link these things up, but it doesn't work as powerfully as it does with stuff coming in from outside. You could get the impression because the what ifs don't, you don't get total relief from the what ifs that, that the flight itself isn't going to be good, but it is. This, this is just that it's the stuff that's already inside is not being intercepted. Like it, see with the stuff here is, for example, if something comes in here, well, I don't know, let's just take a minute. Here's noise abatement. This is where they pull back on the power. It gets quieter. The nose comes down. You feel lightheaded. And if you know what it is, that's that's good. But you could think if the engines got quiet, they quit. You could think that if the plane's nose is coming down, you feel lightheaded, that it's falling. So this, this bothers a lot of people when they don't know about it particularly. But if you feel noise abatement happen, as before you actually feel it, Let's say you've linked it to her face, voice, and touch, and she's like in your unconscious with a big sword, and she just kills off the, the bad stuff on this thing before you're aware of it. But when it comes to um, the stuff that's already inside, uh, linking it to her doesn't, doesn't have as much power because it's already in. Um, so nevertheless, it's worth doing. And and because these things, in, because they're inside are cause stress hormones to be released we try to limit the stress hormones by pretending it's not happening to you it's happening to a cartoon character that lets us this is what they call a balloon and cartoon activity you could imagine it over charlie brown's head homer simpson any cartoon character you want snoopy mickey mouse so 
the thing about cartoon characters is they always get into trouble, but they always get out of it. So we don't take it seriously when we find that they're in trouble. Now, I what I've been playing around with is Homer Simpson sitting at his nuclear power plant. He's not paying attention to it, and it's about to blow up and big nuclear explosion, lots of damage. But he's not. He's not. He doesn't care about that. It's not. That's not important. What he's thinking about is, oh my God, I got a flight tomorrow. What if there's turbulence? So you take that cartoon and put it by her face. Talk mm -hmm. with her about about the situation with Homer, worried about turbulence, not his nuclear power plant, and then get a hug. Um, another one is, of course, this one. What if this doesn't work? You could link that also up to her face, voice, and touch. And then this is a big one. What if I panic? You could link that up to her. But we actually want to stop panic cold. That's what mm -hmm. phase three is all about. There are five main things that happen in a panic attack. Pounding heart, rapid heartbeat. Difficulty breathing, you Popeye illustrate that. SpongeBob to illustrate sweatiness. Scooby Doo to illustrate psychological changes such as disorientation or derealization or racing thoughts. And then Bruce Banner and turning into the Hulk with all that body tension. Now, the idea here is that people who panic tend to not notice it's about to happen until they're in it. They might get a little anxiety and think it could happen, but it hits pretty rapidly. Interestingly, researchers have hooked, people have panic up to heart rate monitors, skin conductance monitors, uh, breathing rate monitors, and they say they pick up the oncoming panic attack two minutes before it hits. This suggests that our unconscious mind might be able to pick it up before we're consciously aware of it. So we want to then have your girlfriend linked to these things in your unconscious procedural memory, which is where we store these links. Anyway, it's in the unconscious part of the brain, and this is where the action is as far as stress hormone release. So what we do is we take each one of the things that could cause trouble and link it to her. So this cartoon here is to illustrate pounding heart. Now, Clark Kent, normally can become Superman, gets on the plane, thinks nothing of it. He'll just become Superman if there's trouble. He'll grab the plane and put it on the ground. No big deal. But after he's in the air, he realizes he's in trouble. This caption says, "I sensation I always feel when I'm exposed to red K, kryptonite. That's the substance that takes away his ability to become Superman. So he's, he realizes he's losing his ability to become Superman. That means if something goes wrong with the plane, He's doomed. Nothing he can do about it. So he starts to panic. And let's say he probably would have the entire panic attack. But we want to focus on, on it as if he just has one element. And that is the pounding heart. He has this blue business suit on or ordinarily. And the way a cartoonist would depict pounding heart would be with huge, bold, red exclamation marks on the chest, which contrasts nicely with the blue. And then alongside the chest, some curved lines, two on each side to indicate the chest is going boom, 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 like that. Um, so that's to be linked up to her face. Then talk with her about it as you look at it together. Poor Clark can't, can't be super today. He's all upset about that. And then get a hug. Now, this one is kind of fun. Popeye, old cartoon character, macho guy, gets on an airplane with his girlfriend, Olive. He's not comfortable, but he doesn't want her to know it. So he figures he maybe can cover it up if he can has, has a can of spinach. He usually does have it. Reaches into his pocket to find it, but he can't find it. What he finds instead is that he's got a hole in his pocket. His hand comes out the bottom of his pocket. Now he knows he's in trouble. His spinach is gone, lost. So he starts to what we call hyperventilate. Olive knows something's up. He's blown his cover. So he might as well see if she can help him. So he turns to Olive Oil, his girlfriend, to say, hey, Olive, I'm having trouble breathing. And to, and to show he's having trouble breathing, he puts his huge fist around that long, skinny neck that he has. He can get his fingers all the way around it. And he starts to say, Olive, can you help me out here? I'm having trouble breathing. But as he starts to talk, he's also getting tense. And as he starts to speak, He's squeezing on his neck, 
and he increases the squeeze until he actually cuts off his air supply. So he comes out, oh, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't breathe. So there's your cartoon. If you can throw that by your girlfriend's face, talk about talk about that with her and then get a hug. Uh, sweatiness. Um, SpongeBob has a lot of panic attacks when he does sweat rolls down his face. I just found this plastic doll at a toy store, threw some water in the face and took a picture of it for our purposes. Now, this one is a little different. Scooby here with his crossed eyes shows something's going on in his mind that's odd. Sometimes they, instead of crossed eyes, they would put stars over his head or spirals over his head. Same thing, psychological stuff going on. Now, if he was in the belly of the airplane and he's in a kennel, when the plane starts to roll down the runway, that acceleration pushes him against the back of his kennel and pins him there. He doesn't know what that's all about. And he hears these noises, thundering sound of the exhaust, feels these vibrations, the plane rolls down the runway, feels acceleration for a long period of time, much three times more than he would experience in a car. And then the plane goes in the air and he feels G-forces and turns. So he might have racing thoughts. He might feel like things are not real, like he's gotten disconnected from reality. Or he might have an out-of-body kind of thing where he imagines looking at himself from outside. If you got anything you can identify, you could throw it in Scooby's mind and link it up, but otherwise skip it. And this last one everybody seems to have, this is Tension. The Incredible Hulk is famous for it. His normal version is Bruce Banner here on the left. Oh, uh, Here he looks relaxed. Here he looks like he's alert. Something's got his attention, and now he starts to turn green, pop his buttons off. And now he's not only popped his buttons off, but you can see this tension in his face. So that's how you can link massive body tension to, um, to your girl's friend's face, voice, and touch. The idea is here, since panic has roughly five elements, all five elements are not going to hit you at the same moment. What happens is you tend to have one of them, and the first one tends to then trigger the second, and the second triggers the third. It's kind of a chain reaction. And so if you take each of the components, each of the elements of a panic attack, and link them to her in a way that each one of them is neutralized, then no matter which one the panic attack tries to start with, it doesn't have a way to gain a foothold. It can't trigger the next one. And so we just stop the chain reaction cold by taking each element and linking it to her face. So we went through phase one, routine stuff, phase two, the what ifs, and phase three, the panic, linking to her face, voice, and touch. Now, what that does is it activates the calming system. The calming system pushes back against the effect of stress hormones. But we can also prevent the release of stress hormones in the first place. When we produce oxytocin, it shuts down the fear system. It's still not quite sure how, but it does. And one of the interesting reasons it shuts down the fear system is something that won't work for you and me, but nursing a child produces a huge amount of oxytocin. A new mom's got a massive amount of stuff to do. Can't keep up with it. Now, when the baby's hungry, she's got to sit for 30, 40 minutes and do nothing about her tasks that she's overwhelmed by. So how can she bear to sit and do nothing for half an hour or more? Well, when she starts to nurse, she produces oxytocin. And the oxytocin just shuts down the anxiety system. So she can have the thought show up, but it doesn't have any, doesn't grab her because there's no push by it, no, no urge, which is what comes from the stress hormones. She can have the thought, but that's as far as it goes. It stays kind of neutral. Um, oxytocin also causes bonding in addition to shutting the fear system down. And nature when you hold a newborn child, will cause you to produce oxytocin to try to bond you emotionally to the child so you'll be protective of the child. You might have had that experience. Um, 
sexual afterglow. Males get oxytocin at orgasm. And nature at this point is trying to get us to bond to our sexual partner. This activity could cause a child to be born. And if we stick with our partner, the um, child may have a better shot because it has two people taking care of it rather than one. Females, well, it's also interesting that then we get so relaxed, we fall asleep and they don't care if we stay. <laughs> That's another <laughs> story. If, if they understood what nature's trying to do, they might appreciate it. But what happens with them is different. When they get sexual foreplay that's romantic and powerful, oxytocin is released. So their fear of getting physically involved disappears. Sometimes it's... You know, used to, with some of the flight attendants I've talked to, they talk, they discussed it because they they sometimes go out with somebody they have no intention of getting involved with, and then for some reason there's some chemistry, and the next thing you know, they're doing it to their surprise. Um, pets. I don't know. I don't know that it has anything to, to do with reproduction, except they're soft and fuzzy and warm, but. Um, if we interact with pets, we produce oxytocin. One more, this is the only other one I know of, and that is if you get a solid extended chest-to-chest -chest hug of oxytocin, but particularly if it's skin-to-skin, -skin, then there's a lot of oxytocin released there. So what, can, what you could do is, is, is you could simply set your cell phone for five or 10 minutes, and every time it goes off, bring to mind uh, some oxytocin-producing moment. Or, but what I suggest you do is just use the strengthening exercise. Because if you go through those things in phase one, those are the things that are going to happen on every flight. And if you just link those up, uh, take some time to do the session two or three times linking to oxytocin production, then when you're on the plane, you don't have to do anything at all. You'll just produce some oxytocin and keep you keep you calm. There's one area that's a little tricky oxytocin-wise, and that is during cruise because there's nothing happening to link to. Didn't know what to do with that for a long time. Then I came up with a workaround. Here's what you could do. When the plane's taxiing out, you've got some time. Tray table in the back of the seat in front of you. Flat, rectangular, plane. Not so different than the screen you're using right now to see images. So you can imagine that your tray table is a computer screen and that you can see a scene of, after making love, see your mate there and picture her. Maybe even notice touch and her scent and hold that in mind for a few seconds so that the image gets linked to the tray table so an hour or two later when you're cruising along and you look up and see the tray table and it'll produce a little oxytocin it works amazingly well that being up high is an interesting thing our i suppose the most basic way to deal with our desires and our concerns is with our own two feet if we are walking around and we see something interesting we can walk over to it and examine it closely or if we see something that leads us to have concern about our safety we could back away from it so our feet give us a lot of emotional control when you get in your car you're off your feet but you know you could just step out of the car when you get in the plane when the door closes you can't step out but at least you know the ground is right there so it's it's still very real uh even though if you're not even though you're not touching it but when the plane takes off now, it's a little different. You're not, you don't have access uh, to it, but you could say, well, we're close to it. So it still is real to you. Where, where it gets tricky is the higher up you go, the farther you are from your control um, affording platform, the earth. Um, and it gets even trickier if it's night and you can't see anything at all. You, or if it's in clouds and you can't see the earth at all. Emotional, well, intellectually, you know it's there, but emotionally, you don't. It, 
it's just not the same when you can't see it. That's a factor. So you could link that also up to uh, your your girlfriend's face and voice and touch. So that sticks with you even when you can't see the ground. She can be calming. What about turbulence? Have you seen that cartoon of Snoopy sitting on his doghouse? He he's pretending it's a World War One fighter stop with camel. That cartoon's been around for a long time. We could assume that after all these years, Snoopy, when he gets on a real airplane, thinks nothing of it because he figures he's a big expert on aviation, a lot of experience. Uh, trots up the aisle, I'm assuming he would end up in first class because he's sort of a celebrity and jumps up into the seat. And he's looking around and he sees a belt. And he thinks that's odd. His doghouse doesn't have a belt. What's that for? Oh, no, forget about it. So he takes off without the belt on. Planes up at cruise altitude. It's okay for a while, but then it hits a bump. And the next thing you know, the plane and Snoopy, the seat, the seat and Snoopy have separated. The plane has kind of dropped out from under him. And he's like in midair with this anguished look on his face, maybe his ears flying straight out. And uh, like, what the heck's going on here? My doghouse has never done this to me. I must be in big trouble. Uh, so that you could link up to your girlfriend's face for some time. Mm -hmm. So that's just the first thing that happens, that feeling, that shock of the plane dropping, which, of course, is going to release some stress on us. Now, what's supposed to happen is as soon as something happens, it might be a threat and we get a sh feeling of alarm. That alarm's supposed to shut down right away. But for many of us, the system that's supposed to shut it down is not working very well. And we stay alarmed until the stress hormones wear off. That's problematic because the plane's not going to just do one bump. It's going to do another one and another one. So you're going to have one shot of stress hormones after another, after another, and it builds up. So Snoopy is going to have some thoughts. And so we need to deal with those thoughts and pretend them there in his mind. Of course, it'd be our thoughts. He might worry that the pilots are going to lose control. He might worry that they're up there fighting for dear life. What they're really doing is they're having coffee and the plane's on autopilot, but he doesn't think that. So it, let's take what he's thinking, that the pilots are fighting for dear life, put it in that balloon-shaped thing over his head, and then link that cartoon to her. Talk with her about poor Snoopy. He's <laughs> thinking the plane's, the pilots are going to lose control. and and then uh, get a hug. He might also think the wings, wings are going to break off. That's not possible, but even if you know it's not possible, it could still come to mind. So anyway, Snoopy's got that picture drawn over his head, plane with no wings. Link that up to her. And he might just worry that it's going to plunge. Put that in a cartoon, leak it up. So that's all about the plane going out of control. We also have to deal with us going out of control, but in order to link it up in a way that doesn't bother us to think about going out of control. We want to figure it's Snoopy out of control. He's thinking if this turbulence lasts too long, I might not be able to hold it together. And, uh, or if it gets really super intense, more than I can do, more than it is now, if it got really intense, I, I might lose it just from the intensity. And what if it's both too long and it gets intense? Definitely. I'd run up and down the aisle howling to be let off the plane and Charlie Brown will yell at me and I still won't be able to quiet myself down. I'm going to run up to the door maybe and go scratch, scratch, scratch on the door to hope somebody will open the door, but it doesn't happen. So I ended up going back in the aisle and totally losing it and pooping on the rug. So there's Snoopy out of control. So link that up. Um, let's see. I, oh, it's one more thing you can do with turbulence. If the day before your flight, if you and another person say maybe your girlfriend go to some stairs, step up from the floor onto the first step, stop there, turn around so that you're facing the floor side by side, looking at the floor seven inches below you. Put your arms around each other's waist. <clears throat> On a count of three, jump. You'll be in midair for about a tenth of a second as you're in free fall. Now, the amygdala would normally react to free fall. Uh, or to protect you. But in this case, it's going to say, no, you don't need protection. How do I know? Because your arms, you got your arms around each other. This is fun. I like it. Do it again. 
And I said, I'll shift the amygdala over from thinking and falling is something it needs to uh, warn you about. Um, not danger, because you're doing it in a delightful way. So that can be helpful temporarily. Meeting the pilot can be helpful. The pilots have to get their checks out of the way before the passengers board because they find something that needs maintenance. They don't want the passengers sitting there for an extended period of time while it gets worked on. Uh, so they don't have anything to do when you get on. And they're generally pretty <laughs> happy to get a chance to meet someone other than the person they're stuck flying with all month. <laughs> And uh, so it works out nicely for both people. They like to show someone who's interested in flying and trying to get over concern about it and how it uh, is something that they find is another day at the office. You could ask them if okay. they know anything about the, the weather having flown in or if it's just from their paperwork. Some airlines now have an iPad that gives weather information that's just seconds old helps them avoid turbulence in a, in a way that we couldn't do just a few years ago. In those first 15, 18 months of life, um, up until then, we depend on someone else to activate our comic system for us by using their face, voice, and touch. And if we have someone who does it really consistently, then we kind of get the idea. We've really got them trained. Every time I get upset, they show up and I feel better. How come I feel better? Well, first thing, when I see my mom arrive, I see that beautiful face, those soft, loving eyes. And even then I know she's on the case, she's going to fix it. And then she says, honey, what's the matter? I can't tell her what's the matter, but she'll figure it out. And then she gives me this hug. So what happens is that the child expects as soon as he gets upset that mom will intervene and take care of it. And his expectation involves her face, voice, and touch. So let's say mom's in a different room. He gets upset, expects mom, he cries, and so he knows mom's going to hear it, expects her to, in any moment, see her face, to hear her say, honey, what's the matter, and get a hug. And so what happens is before she gets there now, his imagination activates the calming system. Her face would do it, but now his imagination can do it. And now the tricky thing is what happens when she arrives and finds he's okay? She might say, honey, I just heard you crying. And I thought you're having big trouble, but it looks like you're okay. But let me give you a hug anyway. In that case, she follows through with this expectation and by her following through with his expectation, his expectation becomes, with a few more repetitions, a program that will activate his calming system anytime he gets upset, whether she shows up or not. But if she doesn't reinforce that, what if she comes in and says, what the heck? You would just scream like, it's the end of the world. I get in here. You're totally fine. What the hell's wrong with you? You know, stop this or I'll give you something to cry about. So <laughs> in that case... You know, it sounds r rational because how is she supposed to know that what's in the child's mind needs to be something she does? Um, so that's why about half of us don't get the immediate pushback. When we get upset, instead of getting this immediate pushback so we can think clearly and, and figure out if we need to do anything or not, pick out whether it's a false alarm or not, um, we stay alarmed clouds our ability to deal with the situation and it, the alarm may last in, for as much as 90 seconds until the stress hormones burn off and in turbulence you know you could get this shot and it starts to fade and then before it can fade you get another shot and another shot and another. so you just don't get rid of the stress hormones and turbulence similarly in takeoff because there's one thing after another after another in takeoff you might take a look at that um there's the engines rev up, the engines go faster. You know, you know that's normal, but the amygdala says, what the hell is that all about? It zaps you with stress hormones because of the engine acceleration. And then you get pushed back in your seat, another thing. And then you hear the thundering sound of the exhaust. The amygdala might react to that. And then the length of time you're accelerating, you're used to 10 seconds of acceleration in your car, but 30 seconds, that could be alarming to the amygdala. And then when you come off the runway, it gets a little quieter, and that might be another change that could bother it. Of course, 
the higher up you go and the more turns you make and all these things need to be linked to a calming influence. 